you have your Bibles open there, at Acts chapter 18. Our passage this morning is very bizarre. Let me just get that out there from the very beginning. It is a strange little passage. I've named this sermon Mysterious Movements on the Mediterranean because our passage really is about as puzzling as an Agatha Christie novel. And I say that for two reasons. Firstly, on face value, it's a peculiar little passage mapping Paul's movements around the Mediterranean. Why did Luke, who wrote this, think that it was important to include those details? And secondly, it also has a lot of curious little details strewn throughout it. Details about Paul getting a haircut. Why include that? This strange business about Apollos and baptism. What's going on there? And he even does a strange and seemingly insignificant thing and then he starts calling his gospel partners Aquila and Priscilla as Priscilla and Aquila. Why does he do that? What are we to take away from that? So this morning we're going to look at this passage really as a trilogy of three mystery novels. Paul and his mysterious trip to the barber, Apollos and his baffling take on baptism, and Priscilla and Aquila and their inconspicuous name swap. And like all trilogies, each of these volumes has something to say in its own right, but put them all together and you find a common thread passing through them all. You catch a glimpse of something that's really close to the heart of the author, both Luke and the Lord. And that is that they're trying to give us a very healthy um, an earthy, real insight into what gospel ministry should look like on the ground in normal everyday life for all of us. Founded on gratitude, founded on real humility, and with real investment in others. So keep that in mind as we go through. So let's look at our first riddle together. Paul and his mysterious trip to the barbers. Our passage this morning starts like this. Verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer in Corinth and then took leave of his brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Cenchreae, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. So Paul stays in Corinth a little bit longer after the failed attempts of the Jews to have him charged, but then he heads to Cenchreae, one of Corinth's ports, so that he can set sail to Syria as he wants to visit Antioch, the church that had helped send him out in the first place on his missionary journey, um, in which he would then make disciples and plant churches. And he takes Priscilla and Aquila along with him on this journey. But before Paul sets off on this trip, he has something very, very important to do first. Not to double-check that he has everything that he needs for this long voyage, not to double check on the church that he's leaving behind to make sure they're okay and they're going to be okay whilst he's gone, but to get his hair cut. Now, isn't that just a little bit unusual? Was he worried about turning up to his sending church, not looking quite his best? Had Priscilla suggested to him that perhaps his current hairstyle was no longer in vogue? No, he visited the barber to terminate a vow that he had taken, and more specifically, a Nazarite vow, which we don't come across all that often in the Bible, but if you want to read about it, you can find all the details of what it included in Numbers chapter 6. But essentially, a Nazarite vow was a very special and costly vow um, to take, and was usually taken in response to the Lord's overwhelming kindness to you. For example, Samson's mother and father committed him to the Nazarite vow before he was even born in response to God's kindness in opening his mother's womb so that she could have the baby. Something very similar happens with Samuel as well and with John the Baptist. All three of these occasions come in the context of barren women 
conceiving through the Lord's help and responding to that incredible kindness by dedicating their children to the Lord. They take these Nazarite vows. But Nazarite vows weren't reserved for children alone, nor only in response to miraculous births. Any man could enter a Nazarite vow. The only thing stopping you, if you lived back then, would be if you were as follicularly challenged as a Grace Church elder. That's the only thing that would get in the way. Sorry, elders. But doing so was very costly, for there were three main stipulations. You couldn't drink any strong alcohol, you couldn't cut your hair, and you couldn't go near any dead bodies, even if your own parents had passed away. You'd be the only one, therefore, not drinking at a celebration, and like an office party here in the UK, people would naturally inquire, why are you not drinking? You look a bit odd with your hair and beard all bushy and unkempt as you walk down the street, wouldn't you? You'd stand out in the crowd. And it would certainly cause a stir when you were not able to attend a relative's funeral. And not only that, but it was quite costly actually to terminate the vow as well. It would cost you at least a ram and a ewe and some bread, which you then have to sacrifice in the temple as a burnt offering along with all the hair that you've just cut off your face and your beard. So why enter into one of these vows? Well, quite simply, it was just a way of expressing your overwhelming gratitude to the Lord for his kindness to you. It was an extravagant and costly and public gesture that screamed to the world of how thankful you are to the Lord and that you are all out for him. But two questions arise then. Why did Paul take a Nazarite vow at this point in his ministry? And how closely would Paul's vow have mirrored the ancient practice now that Christ has come as our sacrifice? Let's try and answer that first question first. Though the passage is not explicit about this, I'm pretty confident that Paul took this vow in response to what happened to him in Corinth last week. Remember what the Lord had promised him in verses 9 and 10. He said, Don't be afraid, Paul, but keep on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And God had made good on that, hadn't he? Paul had a flourishing and stable ministry there in Corinth for over a year and a half, which was a long period of time for him. And not only that, but Gallio's verdict, that that was the proconsul at the tribunal, had set a precedent and gave the church across the region some breathing room. And that was a great kindness to the church. For though it is true that the church is a bit like a muscle or an immune system, that it needs to be stressed in some way in order to grow and to remain healthy, it is also true that it is like a plant, and that sometimes it needs time to establish its roots in order to survive. You don't plant new plants in the ground in January, do you? Because you know the attacks of the frost and the cold will kill it off before it has time to be established. So Gallio's verdict was good news, not only for Paul and his ministry that flourished, but for the church more widely. What Paul and the church in Corinth experienced was no less wonderful and kind as those once barren women had experienced, who we mentioned earlier. The Lord had protected him and the church for a very lengthy period of time, resulting in many finding new life in Christ, and the church grew in depth and number. And Paul simply wanted to take time to give thanks for that. Hence this costly vow that he takes. Secondly, How closely would this vow have mirrored the ancient practice now that Christ has come? Well, it's actually really hard to say. We don't really have a good picture of how Christians related to the temple in that first 30 years or so after Jesus' resurrection. But I think Paul must have modified this vow in some way. And I say that because I simply can't imagine him going to the temple in Jerusalem 
and asking the priest to sacrifice a lamb as a sin offering for him. Now that he knows that Jesus Christ alone is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, I just can't see him doing that. So I think he probably modified the vow in some way, but wanted to retain the sentiment of it. And I think, you know, there's something in this for us, folk, about vows. The Bible is not against vows or extravagant displays of gratitude. It's true, Jesus encourages us to take care when taking vows and not to misuse them, but he doesn't say we can never take, never take an oath. And I think it's actually right as Christians that we find ways to express our thanks to God when he does do marvelous things for us, when we experience his extra special kindness towards us in our lives, when he blesses our ministry together in amazing ways. You don't have to make a vow or promise to do something, but you can do that. You could vow to serve serve God in a new way, perhaps dedicating an evening to help out with a ministry in church if God does something amazing for us. Perhaps if he gives us um, this building that we're looking at, that would be a good reason to give thanks, wouldn't it? It could involve fasting. It could be just simply a public declaration of thanks. Either way, it is a good and right thing to find ways to express our thanks to God for his care and to declare him publicly and rededicate ourselves to him. We need to find ways to do that. It's a basic principle, I think, that must underpin our ministry together. We must have a spirit of gratitude. Not just to ask God for his blessing, but to pour out our thanks to him when he actually does that, when he gives that blessing to us. And to be willing to do that before the watching eyes of the world who might think us rather odd for doing so. But that is what healthy ministry looks like. Quickly, also, before we move on from this curious Barber episode, please also take note to what surrounds this vow. Paul shows real determination, doesn't he, to get back to Antioch, that is his sending church. And I think also to go to the church in Jerusalem too based on verse 22. It says, he went up from Caesarea in Judea. And uh, that language of going up is usually used to talk about going up to Jerusalem, which was nearby Caesarea, because Jerusalem sits up on a hill. And why is he so keen then to do that? Why is he so keen to get to Antioch in Jerusalem? Well, he wants to share what God has done in Corinth with the wider church, doesn't he? That they too might be blessed by this great news of what God has done for him and the church in Corinth. So they too might know the joy of real partnership in that work, whether through prayer or finance, whatever it may be, he wants the wider church to be involved and to be encouraged by this. And just as an aside here, there really is joy in that. It is a joy to invest in one, the one thing in this world that can bring true life to people and bring salvation to people, and that is the gospel. If you haven't experienced that for yourself, well, let me encourage you to start investing, start tithing, start backing gospel initiatives with your bank accounts, and you'll find a great joy follows. It heightens your joy as a Christian. Equally, it's such a joy to be able to partner with people all over the world in prayer. You can't be with them, You can't be there helping them in their ministry, handing out Bibles, opening up Bibles for people, but you can pray for them. And if you don't know something of that joy or you find it hard to do that one, join us on a Thursday evening. We do that every Thursday evening together as we pray together as a church family for other other, um, churches in our denomination and other people and churches and ministries all around the world. So let me challenge you to try that out this week if you don't do so normally. I trust you'll be mightily blessed in doing so. So, what does this mysterious barbershop experience teach us about ministry? The need for extravagant thankfulness in all that we do and the importance of sharing that joy with others so they can partner with us. That's what real ministry on the ground must look like for us. And notice also on that last point, Notice that Paul has the opportunity, doesn't he, to carry on doing further evangelism in Ephesus in verse 20. 
And he purposely says, I'm going to delay that. I'll come back and do that. Because sharing what God is doing with the church more widely is so important, it's okay to delay that for now. That's what, how big an onus he puts on this. Well, secondly, what about Apollos and his baffling take on baptism? Well, while Priscilla and Aquila are in Ephesus, they hear a very eloquent and competent man open up the scriptures, verse 24. He'd clearly been instructed in the way of the Lord, meaning that he was thoroughly a Christian. The Spirit was clearly at work in his life, giving him great fervor for the gospel. And everything he said about Jesus was thoroughly accurate. The man, of course, was Apollos, an Egyptian from Alexandria who had come to Ephesus and being of Jewish heritage, went to the synagogue, eager to persuade the Jews that, there that Jesus is the king that they've been waiting for all along. He's presented as a very impressive individual, a very gifted communicator. We hear more of that in the, in the letter to the Corinthians. Thoroughly competent, thoroughly Christian and thoroughly competent in the scriptures. And by that I mean the Old Testament scriptures as the New Testament hadn't yet been penned. But something was amiss when Aquila and Priscilla were listening. As Priscilla and Aquila listened, they must have thought, this is great. This is great. This guy, everything he says about Jesus is true. He's a great speaker. But he doesn't seem to know that there's a further baptism than John's baptism. As time went on, it became apparent to Priscilla and Aquila that Apollos, though showing signs of being indwelled by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit for his ministry, didn't yet know that Jesus had poured the Spirit out on all flesh. That's the baptism I think he hadn't heard about. Luke chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 reads like this. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, that is the baptism of John, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am unworthy to tie, untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's the baptism he hasn't heard about. The baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Somehow, this intelligent man from one of the ancient centers of the ancient world, um, who knew his Old Testament inside and out and was trained in rhetoric, he's from North Africa, had somehow missed the next development in the story. He knew that John had called the Jewish people to repentance because the Messiah had come. He knew that was Jesus. I'd wager that he knew about all Jesus' life and ministry, his death for sin, his resurrection from the dead, even his ascension into heaven. But then it was all a bit vague for him. He didn't know that Jesus had baptized his church with the Holy Spirit, bringing in the last days and equipping his church for mission in these last days. And yet, bafflingly, here he was acting with further in the last days, as if the last days had come, and was showing evidence that he too had been baptized with that spirit. It's curious, isn't it? And some of us might be there a bit confused ourselves, thinking, well, how on earth is that possible? How is it that he can be baptized in the spirit and yet have no knowledge of it? Well, I thought that at first as well. But then I took a moment and thought about my own conversion experience. Becoming a Christian isn't like receiving a huge data dump all at once, is it? It's far more organic than that. We don't know everything all at once. Even now as a gospel minister, I don't know everything. No, we learn bit by bit by bit. Some bits are really clear and other bits are really hazy. When I look back on my own conversion, I put my trust in the Lord Jesus and became a Christian. 
whilst knowing far less than Apollos did. And I suspect many of us here were exactly the same. But what I did know was so life-changing and so revolutionary to me that I couldn't help but keep it to keep it to myself. I had to share it with other people. And so we tell others of what we do know in the power of the Spirit, even if we know little about the Holy Spirit and his work. Is that not true of you? It was true of me. As Christians, from our earliest days, we're always um, a, a portion of the Spirit is always greater than our knowledge and understanding. Always greater. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Praise the Lord that is true, that he can use us even before our understanding kicks in. That was Apollos' experience, and it's all our experience, if we grew up in a Christian home even. The best illustration I could think of about this this week was this, is that we're all a bit like young teenage children. And that is, our limbs seem to grow disproportionately to our bodies. For while we're all long-limbed and gangly, we're still fully healthy, we're still fully Christians, if you like, but we're all out of proportion. But then our bodies seem to eventually catch up with our limbs and we kind of fill out our frame. And that's the same thing with our faith and understanding. Our faith is our kind of long, gangly limbs. They they, they grow faster than our, our understanding, our bodies. And so we at all times need people to help our understanding, don't we? We need people to help our understanding match the faith and that measure of the spirit that we've been given. And that's exactly what Priscilla and Aquila do here. Notice verse 23, that they took Apollos aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Notice that they didn't give him a lecture in front of the whole synagogue of why he was wrong. Neither did they huff and puff to one another and make a sport of pointing out where Apollos was wrong. Priscilla and Aquila were not fond of the game roast the preacher on a Sunday afternoon, and I hope none of you are either. No, they don't use their, his ignorance as a means to buoy up their own egos, but rather they see it as an opportunity to help him, to nurture him, to invest in him, and to train him further. They see their maturity as a gift that has been given to them by God, which they need to use and exercise to bless others, not as a weapon to tear down or to belittle. There's a great example, I think, of this in church history. Many of you, I imagine, have heard of Hugh Latimer, who um, was martyred alongside his compatriot, um, Nicholas Ridley, in the 16th century in Oxford. But I imagine most of you are less aware of another English monk, called Thomas Bilney. Thomas Bilney. Now, Thomas Bilney was the junior to Latimer in his order. But the thing is, he came to understand the gospel before Latimer. But being his junior, he didn't want to shame Latimer and speak to him in public and share the gospel with him in public because it would make him look like a fool in front of the rest of the monks. So what he did instead, remember this is before the Reformation, he knew one place where he could get time alone with Latimer to explain the gospel to him. So he went to Latimer and said, brother, I have many, many sins to confess to you. Can I confess my sins? They went off to the confession booth together and for hours and hours on end, Bilney shared the gospel and explained the gospel to Latimer because he was so upset that his senior did not know the gospel himself. And in time, and after a few sessions of confession or staged fake confession, eventually Latimer understood the gospel for himself, which he would later give his life for. Now, Apollos was, I think, far more cleared up than Latimer But you get the point, don't you? Use your God-given clarity to invest in others and do it discreetly and with humility if you think a brother is in error. Not making a show, not making a dance of how much more you know than everyone else. I've experienced something of this in my own life. As many of you know, I came to faith at the age of 16 and I will be forever grateful 
I will be forever grateful to a very godly couple in the church I attended. They saw, sorry, give me one moment. (laughs) They saw a zeal for the Lord in me, a thirst for truth and knowledge, and they did all that they could to feed me. They gave me books to read. They would ask me about them. They invited me over to dinner to discuss the Bible. And slowly but surely, and rather discreetly, they helped me to grow into my young, gangly teenage frame. So question for you. Could you be doing the same for someone? Could you be having the same measure of impact in someone else's life? If the Lord has blessed you with knowledge and ability, with clarity when it comes to his word, could you adopt and instruct a younger Christian? Could you discreetly take them under your wing and instruct them in the way? Not to boost your own ego, not to make you feel like you're needed, but for their sake and for the gospel's sake, you never know what will come of that person in the future. You will never know what blessing you bring into their life. And perhaps you're already doing that. Perhaps you're teaching in Grace Kids and you're, you're pouring truth into young minds every week. Well, be encouraged by that. Be encouraged that you get to do that because you never know what's going to come of that. You have no idea what these young kids are going to do in the future, who they're going to reach for the gospel, what they're going to do. Priscilla and Aquila's efforts ended up having a huge impact, didn't they? Verse 27 and 28. We read, And when Apollos wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Jesus, that Christ, the Christ was Jesus. The most important thing you do in your life that has the greatest impact for the kingdom of God might well be investing your time and energies in somebody else. That's an encouragement to each one of us, whatever age we're at, whether we're old, whether we're young, whether we're parents, whether we're not. So find ways to encourage others and to bring them on in the faith. Pour out what God has poured into you. That is how ministry multiplies and that is how the Lord grows his church. Not through big flashy events, but through normal everyday Christians pouring their lives out into one another. Well, finally, and this is going to be a shorter point, I promise you, as there is some degree of speculation in this, but I think it's curious enough to worth mentioning, and that is Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila and their inconspicuous name swap. Last week in verse 2, Luke introduced us to this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. But now, Luke switches their names about in verses 18 and verse 26. And here's the thing, Paul does exactly the same thing when he writes about them as well. Why? Why does he do that? Well, I suspect it's because Priscilla is the bigger character in the marriage. She's the real dynamo, I think. The one with that get-it-done attitude. The star player, if you like. That's not to say that Aquila was utterly quiet and retiring, but they were just one of those couple where the wife seems to be the real mover and shaker. Mrs. Competent, perhaps. She can do anything. We we know couples like this, and I'm I'm sure you do as well. Maybe people are coming to your mind as I speak. And I think this inconspicuous name swap gives us a good godly example of how a couple can partner together in ministry when the husband is naturally more reserved than the wife or perhaps less equipped, or less gifted, that, or clued up than his wife. I think it's fair to say that most Christian couples would find that a potentially quite a 
difficult dynamic. After all, the man is meant to take the lead, isn't he? He's the head of the house. The Bible teaches us that. Here, Priscilla may be named first, but notice that Aquila is always with her, engaged in the exact same ministry alongside her. He doesn't forgo his headship ever, ever. He doesn't shirk his responsibility and say, oh, Priscilla, come on. We all know you're the talented one between us. You're, the, you're far more clued up than me. You don't need me to be involved in this. You just do it on your own. No, he's right there in the trenches with her, quietly leading. He doesn't try and outshine his wife or compete for the spotlight with her. He supports her and helps her to use her gifts for the Lord and his kingdom. He doesn't take a back seat. And though I confess it clearly isn't the central thrust of this passage, and there is some speculation here, I think it is worth taking stock of this this morning. And it does feed into the main thrust of the passage, which is all about real ministry on the ground in real lives. Real ministry is undergirded with gratitude, it involves investment in others, and helping other Christians to shine and use their gifts. That's what we see here with Priscilla and Aquila. If you are a married man and you are naturally more reserved than your wife, well, that is okay. If your wife is more clued up than you when it comes to the Bible, that is also okay. If your wife seems to have been given a bigger portion of spiritual gifts than you, that is also okay. In fact, praise the Lord, because it sounds like you've got a good one. But make sure you support her. Make sure you partner with her. Don't take a back seat. Don't be intimidated by her. Your job as leader of your home is to utilize both, both your lives and both your skills and all your resources together for the glory of God. And there's a way to do that, whether you are loud and gregarious or quiet and retiring. And there's a way to do that if you're a biblical squat scholar or find that nothing sticks to your Teflon-like brain. Ask God for help. Ask him for help for you and your wife to utilize your gifts and your circumstances for the kingdom's sake, just like Aquila and Priscilla did. And of course, this principle applies more broadly, doesn't it, to every kind of relationship that we have in church. Let's be a church that supports one another as we seek together to reach the lost. Let's not be a church known for fighting between ourselves because each one of us wants to be Batman. We can't all be Batman, okay? We can't all be the Red Ranger. And finally, as we close, the last thing we learn from Priscilla and Aquila, I think, is not to waste your unfavorable circumstances. Last week, we learned that Aquila and Priscilla were exiled from Rome. They could have grumbled at that, couldn't they? And become self-protective and insular, just looking out for themselves. But instead... They opened up their lives. They opened up their new home so they could serve the Lord Jesus and his gospel. And the fruit of that was the joy of getting to see the church grow and the next generation being trained up to carry on the noble task of declaring Jesus as king to the world. John Piper has a great little book called Don't Waste Your Life. And in it, he talks about the tragedy of retired Christians, of particularly retired Christians who, in entering this new stage of life, decide to use it by buying a holiday home down by the beach and spending the rest of their days collecting seashells on the seashore. That's all they do. He says that is a waste of life. Don't do that. Whether we experience favorable or seemingly unfavorable changes in our circumstances, our first thought must be, where are the opportunities here for the gospel? How can I use my circumstances to further the kingdom of God? So, we've investigated three curiosities this morning, showing us the need for gratitude to underpin absolutely everything that we do here as a church. Showing us the need to invest in each other and to multiply ministry. And showing us the need to reassess our circumstances and work out how we can use our circumstances, our giftings, and all that we are for the kingdom of God. So let's pray.
for the Lord's help as we seek to do that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you that when we dig down into these curiosities in it, actually it brings clarity as to what you are calling us to do together in your power. Father, please help us by your spirit to be the church you want us to be. Help us to be a grateful church. Help us to be have gratitude for everything that you do for us in our personal lives and together. And we do want to give you great thanks right now, Lord, for the person who shared the gospel with us first or who invested in us that we might become the people we are today who know you and are assured of what Christ has done for us. We pray, Father, that you'd help us to invest in each other to support one another, to pour our lives and energies into one another, that we might declare the Lord Jesus to a watching world. So help us, we pray. Empower us by your spirit. And we pray this for your name's sake. Amen.